Good morning, church. I am so glad to be with you. Let's uh, take a moment to unite our hearts together in prayer from wherever we're uh, joining in from this morning. Let's lift a hand to heaven. Let's pray, Father, we love you and we're so grateful for your presence in our life. We pray now that as we open your word that you would speak. We wanna hear you. Our ears are, are open today. We're ready to receive from you what you have for us in this moment. We pray that we would see Jesus just a little bit more clearly today as a result of opening your scriptures up. Speak to us now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. And I want to say, as we jump in, uh, not only good morning to all of you, but I want to welcome our campuses that are joining us uh, from other auditoriums and locations. So I want to say welcome. Well, we're just going to welcome everybody. Welcome Coco and Pinita and Oceanside. Wow, it's awesome. Awesome to be in church with you today. And a special, special shout out to our friends in the Midwest, in Kingman, Kansas. We love you guys so much. Daniel and Susie, so honored to be doing life with you, even though we're separated by some physical distance. So today we're in a series called I Am. I Am. We are talking about the I Am statements that Jesus made in the book of John. In the book of John, Jesus uh, did very unique things in this one particular gospel, and we're spending several weeks there looking and examining those things. It's an, it's an action-oriented book that John writes. As you know and have learned over the last few weeks, John was a very close friend of Jesus. He had a very interesting vantage point into Jesus' life, and as a result, we got eight very distinct miracles of Jesus, we had eight very distinct witnesses who testified to what they saw in Jesus. And there are very unique statements that he made, eight altogether, I am statements. And, uh, and we've learned so far that Jesus was not just trying to describe who he was. He was trying to give us the full scope of who God is. And he was claiming to be God when he made these statements. The first time we see God declaring himself as I am is in the book of Exodus, chapter 3, to Moses. He says to Moses, I am who I am. And so it is no coincidence that Jesus is making the same statement that I am. It's not um, just a descriptive phrase. It's a title. I am. And then he fills in the blank. And today we're going to jump right in uh, to the very uh, next I am statement. I want to get there quickly, let you see it. My goal is to get you close to Jesus, because if you get close to Jesus, I think everything in your life's going to change. And so look at this with me. John chapter 8, last week we were in, in John chapter 6, it says this, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is the description that Jesus gives us about himself that I wanna focus on for a few minutes with you today. We're gonna learn a lot. I, I thought we would start by talking about light. You know, light is very fascinating and because I'm not a scientist and I have not studied it in depth, but shout out to Google, I learned a few things. I'll spend a little bit of time with you on it. I wanna to talk to you about light speed because this might be the most significant thing about light is how fast it actually travels. Light speed is measured this way. It goes 186,282.4 miles per second. Light speed. I mean, you know, that's fast. Turn to somebody and say, that's fast, all right? That is real fast, all right? Pinita and Oceanside, join us. Tell somebody, it's fast. Like, that's real fast. Light is fast. And, and, and what we'll discover, uh, I think, through this message today is that Jesus obviously knew how incredible light was. And there was not any kind of, uh, there, there is no casual significance or connection it is very intentional that Jesus described himself as light. It moves incredibly. Scientists will tell us about light. Another fact about light is that light doesn't actually have any mass. Now, that's not easy to, or, you know, that's not hard to understand. I mean, light is just moving. It's just there. You can't grab it. You can't hold on to it. But they can't deny the fact that light has tremendous momentum. It has no mass, 
but it has tremendous momentum. In fact, trying to measure the momentum and the power of light, scientists say, is, is a bit more difficult than other invisible things like wind. Like wind is actually easier to measure in terms of power and momentum than light is. And, and they, they struggle to understand how deep, it is just so complex. And so light, until Jesus came along, did we not realize that light actually had mass? Light does have mass in the name of Jesus, in the person of Jesus. If you want to know what light looks like when it takes form into something tangible, look no farther than the light of the world, the self-proclaimed light of the world, Jesus Christ. And so we're going to talk about this today and focus on it. I thought, I, I thought I'd, I'd like to make you, um, um, you know, feel a sense of intrigue and inspiration in being in church today. So I found this fantastic quote about light I wanted you to see. And it's this, light travels faster than sound. And this is why some people appear to be bright until they speak. <laughs> so we're like, some of you didn't laugh nearly enough at that. That's funny. I don't care what you say. That is funny. And the fact that the author is unknown means you ought to just rob that and just take it and be like, you know, I came, I was brilliant enough to come up with that. And so just thought I'd make you laugh a little bit today. I want to talk to you about, can we go back to John chapter 8 for just a moment? John 8, let's go back to this statement. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I got I to gotta help you understand the setting, the setting. Can you just kind of repeat that in your mind this morning? I got to know the setting in which Jesus communicated this. And, I, and I'm going to move fairly quickly with you. But, but what we've learned is that when Jesus began to move about and do his ministry, if you'll go read the book of John, John chapter five and John chapter six and John chapter seven, something happens that you don't see in the first four chapters. And that is that Jesus begins to receive opposition and resistance to his ministry, to his teachings, to the things he's doing. And by the time we get to John chapter eight and he makes this statement, a lot has occurred in his life. I want to just give you the summary, the cliff notes as it is, of where we're at in the life of Jesus. What's happened is he has gained so much notoriety in the things he's done and said that, that he's almost like a fugitive now. You suddenly say, how could that be? He didn't commit any crimes. No, he didn't. But he stirred up so much controversy in the way that he communicated and the miraculous things that he was able to do that that what ended up happening was is that the spirit of fear came along some and convinced them that Jesus was not of God, but he was an enemy of God. And so even religious leaders of his day began to become very nervous about Jesus and they wanted to put a lid on what they saw him doing. And as a result, they were trying to kill him. And he went through this, this amazing season in which about six months he laid low. Like, I'm not going out. I'm not traveling beyond the Galilee. I'm going to hang out here at home. I'm going to, you know, it's like, a, um, like, like he made his own choice to be on somewhat of house arrest. I'm not, I'm not going about and, and causing a scene or bringing attention to myself. And what, what happened is at the end of that six months, the nation of Israel began to make preparation to celebrate one of its annual festivals called the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles. And so the setting for this statement happens at the conclusion of a, an annual holiday for the nation of Israel. It's a biblical holiday. The Feast of Tabernacles celebrates how God carried the nation of Israel for 40 years in the wilderness. Remember that? Remember that? You know, we've alluded to it many times uh, here in our own church that, that Moses was sent to the nation of Israel to help them escape slavery. And when, when he helped them out of Egypt, God spent 40 years extracting Egypt out of them in the wilderness before they went into the actual promised land. Well, the nation of Israel for thousands of years, and even in the time of Jesus, was celebrating that 40-year period of time with a holiday. And, and there's so much to it. Oh, my goodness. You know, they still, to this day, Jewish people to this day, celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Even many Christians celebrate and acknowledge the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles, actually, what, what occurs is, is people will go out and build little tents 
and little temporary structures. It's called, this holiday is also called Sukkot, which is a reference to those. And they build, they would build in the ancient times, they would build on top of their homes, little temporary structures, and they would live in them during the holiday. Now they did all of that to commemorate the nation of Israel traveling in tents through the wilderness to remind themselves God provided for us then when we didn't have a permanent home. There's two, if I can give you just a little more insight into the Feast of Tabernacles, there's two very, very important commemorations. One is they acknowledge that in the wilderness, God performed a miracle of giving them water. You might know that story. It's a kind of a long story, but God out of a rock brought water to the nation of Israel when they were parched, they were, they were dying of thirst and he gave them thirst. And so, so in Jesus, imagine Jesus is in Jerusalem and he, he's been laying low for six months because rumor is they're after him. And he shows up in Jerusalem, it says in secret. You can read about it in John seven. He shows up in secret. Nobody knows he's there. And one of the things that he would have witnessed taking place is that they would, they would commemorate the feast this way. They would take water from Siloam, this, this area, this pool in, in Jerusalem, and they would pour it out onto the ground as a reminder that God, it was like a big celebration. We're gonna pour the water out now and we're gonna remember and we're gonna praise God for how he gave us water when we were dying and then there's one other thing, one other thing, and that is that we go to the temple courts and the inner court and they would, they would use these candelabras and they would light them up during the holiday and they would bring light continually to the temple court to remind themselves of the fire that God miraculously brought in the night, every night for 40 years. And he used a, a fire in the sky to lead them to their next destinations. And so they would light everything up. You know, Jesus makes a comment in John chapter seven. He says, if you're thirsty, you're looking at the greatest drink you could ever have. He goes into chapter eight, no doubt having celebrated this holiday and seeing the light in the temple courts. And when he spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. You know what Jesus was masterful at doing? He did it in the, in the, the first statement we read with the bread of life. He, he is masterful at taking the moment and showing you who he is and bringing glory to God. He's masterful at taking this moment that everybody would, would be celebrating and we're all in agreement that God is amazing. And he takes it and he attributes it to himself. He says, you know that light that God gave you in the wilderness to guide you miraculously? I am that light. I am the one who's gonna guide your path. Here's the, here's the rough part about that whole thing, about all that setting and choosing that setting. <laughs> There's a majority of them who looked at his statements like this and said, you're not bringing honor to God. You are hijacking this moment. You are disrupting this moment. You are a problem in John chapter seven, which we didn't read, I encourage you to go read it. They even tried to arrest him because they wanted to kill him. And it says that they couldn't, they tried to seize him and they couldn't. It was a miracle. Like he's standing there and they're like, we're gonna arrest you, we're gonna get you. And then nothing happens. <laughs> Why? Because Jesus created a controversy. Jesus created this problem because he was light exposing Darkness, he was light exposing some ignorance. He was light showing the way in a way that they had never seen before, but he had to say it. He chose the feast, the annual feast of tabernacles to come out of a six month hiding and to announce, I am the light of the world. Now, let me just remind you, this statement is not just for that moment. In fact, part of the reason it was such a controversy is because this statement had been said before. It had been said before by God himself. The I am had already spoken of the light of the world. And Jesus knew that everybody in his audience and all these people and all this controversy that was going on around him, he knew that they would have memorized and internalized the first five books of the Bible, at least the Torah. And the Torah, beginning with the book of Genesis, starts 
with some very strong parallels to John chapter eight. Like so strong, he meant to repeat what God had already said. Take a look at this. Genesis chapter one, verse one says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless. The earth was empty. The earth was filled with darkness. It covered the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Verse three says, and God said, let there be, and there's our word, what? Light. Let there be light. And there was light. If God said it, it happened. And, it, and light sets in. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. Why is this, why is this significant? Can, can we just kind of, let's, Let's fast forward again to John 8. Several thousands of years later, Jesus arrives and says the same thing. I am the light of the world. What have we learned about Jesus this far? We've learned this, that he was the word of God. John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the word. Just like Genesis chapter 1 says, in the beginning was. And, and, and so Jesus is the word of God. And we also learn this. Jesus said, we read it a few weeks ago in John chapter 6 verse 63, that his words carry the power to fulfill what he speaks. So what we're learning in John is that Jesus is the word of God. And Jesus has the power, his words have the power to do what he says. So if we hit rewind and go back to Genesis chapter one, what do we see? We see this, God said, God spoke and he said, let there be light. What was God's word in that moment? Let there be light. And there was light. What did Jesus say? I am the word of God. And he said, and, and when I speak, it's fulfilled. When God speaks, it's fulfilled. When God says, let there be light, there's light. And there is no other conclusion then, and it's pretty good. It's good light. It's awesome. Jesus then goes on to say in John chapter eight, as we've been studying this morning, that he is in fact the light came into this world and brought life. Jesus was saying, if you can wrap your mind around this, the, the guy with the rumor that he thinks he's God comes out of hiding after six months to the Feast of Tabernacles and he stands up and he declares to the people of Israel, to the leaders of Israel, to the everyday people of Israel, I am God and I am the spoken word of God. I am the light of the world. And can I just tell you, it didn't go well. It was not received well. Things did not get easier because Jesus was honest. Things got harder for him. But can I tell you, it didn't matter. He had all the power to fulfill what he said he was and what he was going to do. He is the light of the world. I want to give you this, this insight. Some of you read, some of you wear reading glasses, right? A show of hands. How many, how many reading glasses people? All right. All right. We got a few. All right. You wear glasses. Some of you wear glasses all the time. Do you know why glasses work? Glasses work for a very specific reason. And, and I want to share you just a little insight to that. Glasses work because when light is traveling, right? And light's fast. We already cleared that, right? 186,000 miles per second, right? Light is fast. But when it hits glass, when it hits glass, here, here's an interesting thought. When it hits diamonds, because everybody likes to look at light when it hits diamonds, right? This is like, look at the glare. Look at the, look at the, look at, look how it just, you know, reflects everywhere, right? When light hits a diamond, it slows the speed of light to almost a third of what it was traveling before it hit the diamond. That's why diamonds sparkle, by the way, because light slows down. You know, glasses work in the same way. They slow light and the rays of light bend in a new way. 
And because of that, because of that, it corrects your vision. You see as you are supposed to see when the light hits your glasses. You, you see differently than when they're not there because light is moving so fast that, that, that you can't get the correct vision. And so those of us who, who, who our eyes are, are not working quite as well as they once did have the beauty of eyeglasses that slow those light rays and correct our vision and help us see. Here's what I want you to know. This is so important. It's, it's what John wanted us to know, that, that God is light, that Jesus specifically is light. He moves at such a speed you could probably never keep up. But when he put on flesh and bone, the incarnation, it's called, of Jesus Christ, God in a body, God in the form of humanity, a human skeleton, flesh, and structure. It is your corrected vision for your life. In other words, Jesus isn't glasses, but Jesus inside the context of a human body is your eyeglasses to correct the vision so that you can see as he sees. I'm telling you, if you get close to Jesus, you're getting close to God in humanity, God incarnate, and he will show you how to see life. He will show you how to see your world. He will show you how to see your dreams. He will show you how to see your existence by his corrective vision. God is really good. The light of the world, when it arrived, it was really good, like really good. I know today that some of you could stand up here and you could easily testify. You could e easily be a witness to how the light of the world has corrected some of the things in your life. But for those of us who are beginning in that journey, those of us who are curious about that, I just want to tell you, if you'll get close to Jesus, if you'll get close to Jesus, he'll do some, I want to show you what the corrective vision process will look like. I want to just give you a few things. I want you to write them down, okay? In fact, everybody write these down. Write them down. I want you to go study them. I'll give you some verses to look at with them. But if you'll get close to Jesus, there's, there's at least three things that are going to happen. Number one is this. He will take what's formless in your life and he will form it. He will take what doesn't have form and he'll bring form to it. You could even say it this way. If you get close to Jesus, he will reform your life. Here's what the scripture says in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse nine. God will form you as a people holy to him, just as he promised you. If you keep the commandments of God, your God, and live the way he has shown you. Live the way he's shown you. You say, what has he shown me? Look at the life of Jesus He's your correction. He's the thing that brings your vision into alignment. You get close to him and God will form your life the way it was intended to be lived. I remember when I was a kid in school, you probably have this experience. In art class, we got to work with clay. Anybody ever, you know, you get to work with clay and you're gonna form something. You get to choose something to make out of clay and then you're gonna paint it and it's gonna get glazed. It's gonna go in that kiln and it's gonna come out. It's gonna be perfection. But when you're 13, it comes out and it's mediocre. That's what it's like, you know. It's like I have a bowl made of clay that may or may not hold, you know, soup. You know, it's like, like I'm not sure if it'll work or not, but it's kind of there. One of the things that's important to, to recognize that in, in using that, that, that art form is that never once does the clay determine what it's going to be. I determined it. And even though as a 13 year old, it was mediocre. Okay. All right. Give me, cut me a little slack. Like that's us in the hand of God. We're the clay. He's the potter. That analogy is actually given to us all throughout the Bible. Let me show you one place. Isaiah chapter 64 says, yet you Lord are our father and we are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. I'm just telling you, if you get close to Jesus, if you come close to the light of the world, it's going to form your life and reshape your life into what, is, what life is supposed to be. God, remember, God said in the book of Genesis, he looked at the, 
He looked at the formless world and he said, let there be light. And it brought form to the world. It will bring form to your life if you'll get close to the light of the world, Jesus Christ. Second thing is, is this. He'll take your emptiness and he'll fill it. You'll move from empty to fulfilled. Now, I think it's ironic that oftentimes some of the most, some of the most seemingly full lives are actually people who are most empty. Because from the outside looking in, we can look at somebody's physical appearance. We can look at their career. We can look at the possessions that they own. Come on, you know, 2020, you can look at their Facebook account, their Instagram and think, oh my goodness, if I only had that life. Wow. And I'm just telling you that that oftentimes what we're able to project and, and able to create in the perception persona of our life that looks so full is sometimes the most empty people. I wonder if you're falling victim to somebody else's highlight reel because you're living in this poor state of thinking that if my life was more like what I see in other people, it would be more full. Can I just tell you, it might be more empty than you already feel at the moment. And so, and so here's, here's what we have to understand about this. The measurement for someone's fullness is not what you can see. It's the invisible thing that you can't see. What I mean by that is some of the most faithful people to Jesus, you will never know their name. You will never be inspired by their highlight reel. You will never understand where the peace comes from their life. And yet they are full to the brim of the spirit of God in the fullness of his, of his fruit in their life. You know, that, that sometimes what, what doesn't catch your attention is the life that is most full. And the only measurement for full is faith. The only measurement for someone's fullness is if they're faithful. Let me show it to you in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 11 says, the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. Until you get the corrective vision of the light of the world as the lens for your life, (laughs) you won't see the invisible. You won't see. You'll lack the faith. The, The act of faith, the action of faith is what distinguished our ancestors and set them above the crowd. Sometimes we have to understand that the most full life is hard to recognize because even though we're trying to set good example, even though we're trying to live right so other people can see God in us, can I just tell you, sometimes, sometimes faithless eyes will not see faithfulness. They won't see it. Don't get duped into thinking that your fullness is determined by what everybody can see on the outside. If you get close to Jesus, he'll do an inner work in you that will bring a peace between you and him that's sometimes just for you and him. The last thing is this, if you get close to Jesus, there's some darkness that's gonna be chased out by light. There's some things that's gonna move. I remember as a kid, I don't know if you had this experience. I remember, I remember you know, waking up to my mother's voice. She would come in the room and she would sit down on the bed and she'd say, good morning. You know, she might brush her fingers through my hair. Good morning, time to get up. And I remember that, that she would quickly move from that position and head out the door. And as she went out the door, you know what she did? Maybe like your mom, she flipped on the light. Right, And my darkness moved to light very quickly. And I could just tell you that was uncomfortable, right? It's like, could you please not do that? You know, like, please just let me lay and get, hey, mom, can you wake me up 15 minutes early tomorrow just so I can lay in the dark for a while? You know, like, like, can I just stay in that comfort for a moment? Can I just tell you, if you get close to Jesus, he's gonna actually call the darkness out of you and turn it into light. 
And it's not always going to be comfortable. It's going to be awkward. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take some adjustment. Remember that? It's like, I'm going to hide under the blanket until my eyes can kind of adjust to all of this, right? Well, that's what happens. Sin, we get comfortable in. Sin, we actually enjoy. Sin feels really good sometimes, even though it's really awful what is done to our existence and to our soul. But if you get close to Jesus, he's gonna make some adjustments. He's gonna help you walk in light, not in darkness. In fact, I'll show it to you in this scripture. It comes from Galatians chapter five. Among those who belong to Christ, when you're with him, everything connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessity is killed off for good. And it's killed off because it's crucified with Christ. You know what every day you wake up is? It's a day to adjust by crucifying self and sin to the cross one more time, to leave it behind. In fact, that's how I wanna close with you today is I wanna talk to you about you know, something I didn't mention. If you'll go and read John chapter eight, right before Jesus says to everyone, who's listening at the, this big celebration, right before he begins to speak, I am the light of the world, he does something that no one else was willing to do. And it's very specific and it's very focused on one person because that's the ability of God. He can speak to the masses, but he can also come into your world and touch your heart. He is not limited to just a big megaphone of communication. He can actually come and speak to you right where you're at. He can speak to the circumstances of your life. He can, he can step in. So here's the story, and I wanna close with this in mind. Here's the story is in the midst of this, as this feast is coming to a close, God, Jesus is there, and, and the rumor is that he thinks he's God. That's what's, and there's murmuring, and there's, it says there's gossip, and there's all kinds of things going on about Jesus, and and, and people don't like him. And the, the rumor is this too. The religious leaders are going to kill him. And they've set up this scenario where they've actually gone and found someone in the act of adultery. Talk about awkward. Talk about horrible. And they drag this woman out of wherever she is in this horrible action. And they bring her before Jesus. And they say to Jesus, they say, the law of Moses says that we should kill this woman for her action and for her sin. What do you say? And if you know anything about the story, Jesus kind of ignores that crowd. And he gets down in the sand. He gets down in the dirt next to her. He doesn't say anything. And they press him again and they keep accusing and they keep condemning. Can you imagine how embarrassing that moment is? I mean, nobody should be committing adultery. Could we all agree? Not a good move. But but to shame and embarrass people in the midst of their sin is a whole nother level. And Jesus is there and they finally press him to an answer. And Jesus says, listen, for all of you who've never sinned, go, go ahead and toss the first rock. Go ahead and give the first blow. Go ahead and, and take action against her. And from the oldest to the youngest, they walk away. You know that story. You know what's most important about that story? is that when they all walk away, Jesus gets down on his knees. He lifts that, that woman's face up and he says to her, where are your accusers? Who's left to condemn you? And she can't help but answer honestly and say, no one's here to condemn me. And he says to her, neither do I. Neither do I condemn you in your sin. Do you know why Jesus said that? Because you've already been condemned You've already been condemned by sin. You've already been embarrassed, shamed, tormented, and tortured by sin. You've already begun to feel the effect in your life and the consequences of sinful action. And God did not send to us a condemner. He said in John chapter three, he sends to us a savior from our condemnation. And I just want you to know, Jesus has a big and broad message to say to lots of people, but he also has a very specific message to say to your heart today, which is this, go and sin no more. Jesus is the one who steps between you and your sin and says, I'll cover this Let's walk in a new direction. 
I'll cover this. Let's walk in a new direction. I want to invite you to stand to your feet right now. And uh, I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. As you do, I want to speak to that person in the room right now who says, I don't know Jesus intimately, and I don't have a relationship with Jesus, but I absolutely feel him drawing me to him right now. And if that's you, if that's you, that's who I would like to speak to in this moment. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you this prayer. If you would say, Pastor, I don't know God, but I feel him drawing my heart, and I would like to know him more intimately. Can I just invite you to pray this prayer with me if that's you? Would you just say, Jesus, I need you. I need you in my life. I believe that you are the light of the world. And I believe that not only did you forgive me for my sin, not only have you stepped between me and my sin like you did for that woman there in John chapter eight, but I believe, God, that your light has the power to form some things in my life, has the power to fulfill some things in my life, and has the, has the ability to walk me out of some of my own darkness into your light and into your path. And, and I want that. Would you just tell him, I want that. Thank you for coming into my life. From this day forward, I, I just ask you to teach me how to walk step by step with you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.